No. No, I was yeah. I was about to be swayed by the charismatic leader of this podcast by Indeed. not speaking up. You shut your mouth, Laura. <laughs> I am God's appointed podcast host. <laughs> not you how we do this mouth. here. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Beer Christianity. My name is John T. I'm Laura. I'm okay. <laughs> That's our three national songs encompassed in one, <laughs> one subtle greeting. Uh, welcome to the episode. This is a part two, two of two. So if you haven't listened to part one, you should go back and listen to part one. They always do that on real podcasts. Have you noticed? It's so exciting to be able to do it. I oh, wow. Proper. Um, uh, it's weird to get all excited and, and enthusiastic about it. Now I have to tell you um, that we have a trigger warning um, and that we will be talking about abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse. About Mike Pilavachi, we're going to be talking about uh, Ravi Zacharias a little bit more. And if you were listening to the first episode, which you should have come back to listen to now, um, you will have heard Matty Fearon talking about his experiences at Ravi Zacharias Ministries in the UK and how that went down so um yeah guys what did you what did you think so i was intrigued by his thoughts about ripping up the rule book and kind of turning down the foundations and starting with um safeguarding as a cornerstone um but also the fact that he mentioned um, i'm gonna misquote him but effectively the church is open to this stuff because it is a place for the vulnerable um and i think those two things are interesting and my feeling is it feels like a pendulum swing if you go too far one way if you're too clinical and i don't know i'm struggling for words but safeguardy <laughs> then it feels like <laughs> actually what about people needing help like oh man i'm going to drop another one in um because I know people who were involved with the Jesus Army, which it was a community um, that went south and there was lots of abuse there as well. Um, but also the person I was speaking to was saying, like, actually for people who were desperate and, you know, um, substance um, addicts, then it was amazing and transformational. And, you know, the fact that you could just turn up somewhere and get help like, I don't know, it feels, I'm sure charities do it, but yeah, what do you guys think in terms of like, can you still be open to those vulnerable people and have those kind of um, just human, helping a, helping a Samaritan, like I guess there's, a, you could say, you know, the good Samaritan could be red taped out of <laughs> being able to actually happen. Mm. And it's really difficult because I, absolutely we need to make sure that there are appropriate channels within church structures for safeguarding to to happen and um you know it's really important that there are avenues for people to seek help for abuse absolutely can we rip up the rule book and um, can we rip up the church and start it again and grow it around those structures i don't know that we can because i just it, the church is so embedded into what we is into our into life into what we do i don't think there's a way that there is a way to do that possibly and also you know we've been trying to figure out this church thing for two thousand years we all know that the church is not a is not a foolproof environment it's not it, there is no way that nothing is going to go wrong in the church. And I don't think there's going to be any way, but maybe because of that vulnerability, maybe because of just the human sin, I don't think there's any way we can create a church where there is not something that's going to go wrong with it. And again, kind of what you were saying, Malky, actually, is it is, you know, a lot of people have gone into this thinking about, gosh, what does this mean for my face with Soul Survivor? And, you know, yes, Absolutely, there were things that were wrong with Soul Survivor. There were absolutely, um, you know, there was abuse that occurred there. We know that. We know that it was not a perfect church or the camps, that they were perfect camps or situations. But did it bring hun hundreds, two thousands of young people to faith in Christ? Absolutely, it did. And I'm, I'm one of those people. And I had a great my experience there was was fine, but it was, you know, it is a foundational experience of my faith. Yeah, I, I don't know from from that whether there is a way that, 
other than kind of kind of to retroactively embed sort of safeguarding principles in the church. It feels like that's really the only avenue we could do it. But the other question that Matthew posed was, how does this affect our faith? And I think it's kind of important to, and we'll kind of, I think, get into this a bit later with, with Matty's, um, the other stuff that Matty um, speak, speaks about. Um, you know, just thinking about um, myself, my own experiences as a survivor, and, and and I was, I think, after a few, having a chat with some some friends, and it, a lot of them were kind of really disheartened about it and kind of being able to be like, oh, like, what are my thoughts about it? How how do I feel about this? What what is my thing about it? And I think being able to conclude from that actually that I don't personally in my faith, my faith doesn't feel particularly affected by the situation because my main takeaway from Soul Survivor is the experience I had with God, not the experience I had with Michael Avachi. And I and I think that's really important to recognise when we're thinking about if your takeaway from a particular church, from a particular situation is gosh that preacher was really amazing or oh, that preacher's like, I felt amazing because of what that preacher has said I think evaluate you know how you're framing that is that it should be you know, yes like a, a preacher can do it and amazing things and, and uh, God can use a preacher and use a speaker in amazing ways and obviously Mike Pilavachi was instrumental in that in my experience as a soul survivor but th- that's not what I take away my takeaway is, is my experience with, with God and I, I, that's kind of really what we should be thinking about in those situations yeah and I think instrumental is a great word there because people can be more than one thing and they can be a um they can be an instrument of God while still being incredibly fallen um and terrible. And I don't know what the theology is on that. Like, why would God use people who were doing terrible things, evil things? Um, I I don't understand. Why it, did God really. use prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors and murderers? Paul's murderers. a murderer, you know, like Moses is a murderer. Yeah. Again, like I can see why a lot of people outside of the faith think the faith is fucked up because of that stuff. And we've got to be so careful not to equate that with so it's fine you know and the guy's still a hero you know like you have to be able to kind of separate these things out but i think if a person can be more than one thing they are just the instrument and you got to remember if we're you know i i remember having this conversation around the hillsong thing where they were like oh brian houston you know been doing some pretty fucked up things you know so how does that affect your faith and i was like I'm a Protestant, my guy. I don't care who the preacher is. I don't like, it doesn't make any difference to me. Like I happen to like my pastor. I think he's amazing. I, you know, but if it turns out he's not amazing, I'm not worshiping my pastor. I'm, I'm worshiping God. I I don't, I don't actually need a pastor, you know, like, and that may be a very unhealthy attitude to have in terms of personal discipleship or whatever, but like, you know, I can go, oh, that's a shame. Oh, we need to, you know, I can take some responsibility if I'm part of a church in which that has happened. But my personal faith has never really been that, you know, I was led to to the Lord by somebody who at the time I thought was cool and who turned out to be a bit of a douche. Um, a lot of the pastors of my early church, uh, my the early church, um, you know, like I see them now and I find their views so objectionable, but I'm very grateful to them for for helping me along a lot of incredibly dedicated christians in congo or in ghana are very you know grateful for the missionaries does that mean that the colonial mission project was entirely good no but does it mean that no good from it came from it also no uh melky um is there anyone john tate because i'm (laughs) this is going to reveal a lot about our relationship you don't give a fuck about the special people i'm completely I am all in. <laughs> That's what, why you, you love me. Now. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I will hitch my wagon. <laughs> um, but, but you know the- that I'm a fuck up, and you know that I'm a douchebag. So it's like what, like it's like what would come as news? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, mean, I think for you, yeah, yeah. In terms my brand of is not feeling. what a good guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's so um, holy and pure. But is there anyone for you um, that would? Uh, trouble you or shake it because for me like it's different it's different to like a, a kind of a, I don't know sports figure that you like I know, I know you're into sports I'm going to use sports analogies for yeah, you yeah thanks that'll, that'll really bring me in 
<laughs> or well, a musician, that's not going to work at all. But like, um, well, Marilyn Manson. I like yeah. Marilyn Manson. I thought he was very good. Yeah. And when people were like, you know, he's been horrific to some people, I've been like, yeah, what a fucking surprise. Like, yeah. did you read his book and did you listen to his music? Like, yeah. you think, like, only if you assume he's faking, you know, like, I, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Like, so, I mean, yeah. it was surprising that he was actually doing it, but like, you know, okay. Also, I was always like, yeah, but I mean, he's kind of like, our Elvis, he's not the blues, you know what I mean? He's just window dressing. So, like, he can be a douchebag. If a friend of Trent, Trent Reznor was a douchebag, I'd be like, I don't know, he broke one of his musician's arms on stage. And I thought that was, they were all, it's all consensual. It's fine. I don't know. It's okay. <laughs> so, but, so as far as I'm aware, none of those it's guys. A different are saying, scene, Laura. Don't look at me like that. It's a different <laughs> scene. It's fine. Okay. For me, so it'd be Richard Raw would be the closest yeah, cool. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, and it's, so. Well, because those guys, as far as I'm aware, are not telling you how to live and are not saying, like, I've found the thing that, like... And I've cr- never I've yeah. never really had much time for people who act like they're... I have a natural um, distrust of people who everyone else really likes. <laughs> Just, mm. you know, and that is part of me being a dickhead. But yeah. <laughs> there's a reason I haven't read the unbearable. What's it? I was going to say the unbearable, unbearable likeness of being. That's not it. Wow, well, Kandera is now coming under fire for no apparent reason. <laughs> Just like screw you, Kandera. What's the, the Harry book? John Mark Comer. Oh, the unbearable likeness of Harry. The unbearable, <laughs> the ruthless extermination of people who hurry. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, the ruthless yeah, hunting for sport of people who hurry. Yeah, that's which is fun. cruel, I think, because by definition, mm. um, yeah, the John Mark thing, exactly. Like, I'm just like, uh, he's probably fine. Yeah. I definitely now that Rob Bell is out of favor, I'm like, I've got more time for him. So <laughs> I don't, I don't think that that kind of contrarianism is is no, righteousness. I, I'm I must the be careful same. of being, you know, <laughs> like, like you, it's easy to go. You see, so I never fall. It, but then it, it just means that you're you're never kind really. Of a dickhead. Yeah, you're kind of a dickhead, like like me. And that's right. We all are. Well, <laughs> Yeah, we'll wear that badge. Yeah. So, so I don't know. But like if Richard Raw um, was revealed to have been doing that stuff, I would feel very sad. Um, but I'd be sad that I'd just be like, oh, that's so fucked up. I'd be so disappointed because I looked up to him so much. But like I look up to him so much and often I read his stuff and I'm like, oh, it's a shame he's a heretic. You know, like it's, it's like, I don't know. I... Uh, it, I think it helps if you start from a position of self-loathing. This is not a theological statement, but like if if you think of yourself as a bit of a piece of shit, then I don't know. Like it's hard to judge other people, but it's also hard to assume they're going to be great. You know, like uh, and I think our our third and final guest recording on this talks a little bit about the. Um, uh, just the, the the willingness to to be to be whispered to in your ear that you you two are mortal. I think that's quite quite important. There's a little teaser for that coming up a little bit later. So, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer the question, Malky? Yeah, yeah, and that feels very healthy because I think I do gravitate towards the person, like what. Uh, it's partly why I've swung from extremes like, okay, Calvinism is the thing. Anyone <laughs> yeah. who's in the gospel coalition, they are sound. And what they've got to say, that's the thing. And this theology will save us. This is the key. They've cracked the code. Um, so like for me, for the Mark Driscoll thing, like deconstructing and then going, man, I think that's pretty fucked up in lots of ways. And then here's the Mark Driscoll thing. I'm like, Yes, it was. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> like what a surprise. He's, you know, it turns out in private, he's like a misogynist and a narcissist and a bully. It's like, who could have guessed? What a shock. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but yeah, for, for again, Raw, Brian McLaren, like those kind of guys, um, yeah, who the, I guess their brand is anti that. You know, it's like they talk a lot of, or, or it feels I, like they're, they're, yeah, but 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 I, it's going to happen. Like, mm. a darling of the left is going to be revealed to have been a terrible person. Like, that's that's definitely going to happen. And I'm not saying I'm looking forward to it, but I'm looking forward to the progressive We're shutting the fuck up occasionally. Names, to be clear. Oh no, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> it is not Rora right McLaren. Haven't we? We've slandered McLaren before on this show. Oh, yeah, we have. Completely 
inadvertently we're so sorry brian we love you but um yeah like uh, yeah so i think my i think my thing would be on the response you know it's kind of how like of course yeah i totally believe they can fuck up all kind of problematic behaviors going on um because people are human beings but yeah, i think it's the response i think that's what i would find painful if they responded badly if they if they you know responded like a like a ravi zacharias mm. and hid behind oh a spiritual attack or blah 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 you know i think it's, um, it's also useful to think of the the fact that they are people they are fallen we're all potentially people who would engage in problematic problematic activities or behaviors or whatever um but is there something more that causes or allows it? Because, because as um, Matty said in the previous episode, you know, you can't just think about this as a bad apple um, issue. Uh, you know, is there something? Now, is that true? I don't know. I think I think it is perfectly legitimate to say bad people will do bad things. But as he said, it's about what happens afterwards and what what kind of marks are there that you could look out for? What are the red flags? And so we're going to play you another clip from Matty now. The only reason we were able to see that is because an independent report was commissioned and conducted by people with a huge amount of experience in that area. So how do we respond? Practically, we respond by doing that. And we need to examine what our institutions look like. We need to look for where the alarm bells are. And there's those, there's those subtle ones. Alarm bells can start ringing in an institution when you look at the bookshelves in that institution, when you look at the reading lists of that institution or the watching lists, and to see how closely guarded they are, to see how they brook books that oppose their theology or or seek to offer a different way of looking at life and faith and our engagement to that, how prayer groups are organized, who leads prayers, what the prayers contain. It was one of the ways in which um, the employees were, I guess, emotionally and spiritually manipulated at, uh, at the Zacharias Trust. Um, prayer was used as a method of coercion, a method of spreading the accepted party line. And... Um, woe betide you if you didn't hold to that party line. And so there are a lot of different marks that we can look out for to ensuring this doesn't happen again. I guess there's something to be said in all of this of responding with grace. And I suppose in a way grace is ours not to, not ours to be offered, but we must create the situation in grace, which, in which grace is allowed to flow. I think the independence speaks to that because that is the gracious way to act towards the victims who are the primary focus of our response to this. They must be. And then we get closer to those that were in positions where they could have known, where maybe they should have known, and that's what the stories are suggesting to us. And we have to look as to what it was, I guess by initially not condemning, and there can be grace in withholding judgment. Why do people who hold positions of influence and responsibility with a deep Christian faith lay aside that faith to keep abuse quiet? And then we must remember, after all of that, that hurt people hurt people. That one of the hardest things about understanding evil those that perpetuate abuse is it invariably comes from a pace of pain and so somehow within this process there must also be room for understanding the damage that was first caused that does i think i guess i really want to emphasize that that comes later that only comes after the victim has been attended to that only comes after safe spaces have been created. That only comes after those in those positions of power are able to look themselves in the mirror, to repent, to speak publicly 
of how they failed, to speak to the victims of how they failed and what it is that they will do to ensure that this never happens again. That, I think, maybe is the debt that those that turn the other way owe to their fellow brothers and sisters in, in Christ. Uh, we mentioned it uh, in the first episode, but I think it's worth mentioning again that that no victim or survivor of abuse owes anybody anything in terms of their own recovery uh, or forgiveness or any of that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, Matty's thoughts there, I think, very powerful. Um, what are your thoughts, guys? Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on him saying about um, kind of what we are open to within organisations are kind of when it becomes kind of a matter of kind of what theologies do we allow and and what are we allowed to yeah, engage with, I guess. I think beyond almost having like kind of the reading list and the bookshelf and the watch list on that, I, I would kind of go beyond that to say what kind of, what discussions are you allowing to take place without trying to convince one another of your side? I think that's really important in that on on both ends of the spectrum, I think, and I think a lot of people will probably say this sort of thing of like, you know, what's on your bookshelf in terms of like, you know, let's be more open to kind of more liberal ways of thinking. I would actually encourage those of us on the left hand left side of things to be open to to discussion with people who don't believe in the same things that you believe, not in order to be convinced either way, but 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 to see those people as human and see those people as, as, as children of God and people of God and godly people. And and I think it's important for all of us on all sides to see that because otherwise we are just going to narrow ourselves into theological positions. Mm. And that if we are in those echo chambers and we're not allowing differences of opinion to be okay in those in those institutions and those spaces that is where people are going to be you know shunned and ousted and and seen as other and seen as not part of the space and that is where people can end up facing abuse i think it's yeah it's being gracious on both sides to to listen to opinions not to be convinced because, you know, there are some opinions that I think people hold that are wrong <laughs> and I don't want to convince them, but I'm still happy to listen because I think it's it's worth seeing that person as a person. And I guess there's a difference between, you know, me hanging out with my, you know, octogenarian friend this morning and us having a wonderful time hanging out for three hours, you know, eating Ethiopian food and drinking coffee and arguing about literally everything, you know, everything, sexuality, gender, Islam, freedom of speech, the church's, per like literally everything. And I love that guy. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a difference between that which I think makes you a more rounded person if you can be friends with people who hold different views from you, particularly for Christians of like, hey, do you have any non-Christian friends? Because if you don't, that's weird. And being tolerant of things that should not be tolerated. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah. I don't think Nazism or any ideology no. that is that believes in genocide because people are gay or a different race or whatever, that's that it, the belief that is come almost, under that <laughs> yeah, it doesn't come, it doesn't come under that. But being a Tory probably does, yeah. um, you know, and unfortunately, and maybe that's again a kind of a mark of distinctiveness for Christians potentially of we can be, we can be more tolerant in the way that Jesus was not just friends with the prostitutes and the people with leprosy and the, you know, he was also friends with representatives of the occupying army <laughs> or he was kind to and associated with them. He was, he was definitely had among his, uh, you know, disciples, people who were acting on behalf of the occupation to oppress his people. Do you know what I mean? Left and right are represented there. Um, and that's okay, but if we're going to be def if we're going to be creating like not just badges of belonging, but conditions for belonging in our Christian organizations, perhaps they shouldn't be so theological, and perhaps they should be more about praxis 
you know, the thing that you should be, you know, making clear is not okay is treating people like shit rather than having the wrong views on homosexuality. You know? But does, then does how it... does, does that not quickly get into, yeah, the re- liberals are right on this and the conservatives? Are okay, wrong. I told you never to speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> All of Malky's views <laughs> fall under that umbrella. Being, we've discussed this. This you doesn't are bear repeating. <laughs> Shush, no. Um, because, yeah, as an ex Calvinist type, then um, they were all about banning books. And no, we've read this so you don't have to. And these are the kind of um, caricatures of where this person's wrong. Don't engage with that. It's. Um, heresy, and it will lead you down a slippery slope. But I think now, um, with with the the progressive work movement, I think we're fine because yeah. there there are things there where it's like, oh, you you cannot engage with this. Like there are differences of, differences of opinion, and not differences of opinion that are like, I do not believe you're a real person who exists, but differences of opinion of like, well, how do we fight the patriarchy? That you know can get very heated for sure, but. I don't think should bar us from dialogue. Um, as And I can totally understand why people who are at the center of those things would find it very hard to dialogue with those people. And again, I make no fucking, you know, pronouncements about you have to be willing to dialogue with people who oppress you. No, you don't. Um, it's quite nice when we do, um, if it's productive, perhaps. And you don't, um, you can say, you don't have to dialogue with those people, but you don't have to cancel people for dialoguing with those people. <laughs> Do you know yeah, what I, mean? I like, think. But and it becomes complicated because, like, oh, you gave that person a platform, you know. And there are people who we've had conversations that have been like, oh, so you know, who should we have on the thing? I'd be like, I'm not putting that person on the thing. Fuck that. So I, I don't want to because again, it's not a case of um, I don't believe any Christians should uh, fellowship or dialogue with this person. Um, it's just I don't want to help their ideas or them as a person gain more popularity. I, it's just a thing I don't. Or I don't want to spend any time with them because <laughs> I think that's also that's allowed, right? We're allowed to just not like people. Mm. That's still fine. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. apparently that's kind of my thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I think I think it all comes with the with the kind of thing of like you know it's okay to have a difference of opinion. Like you don't have to like someone. You don't have to agree with them doesn't mean that there isn't space for for some kind of dialogue um and also bear in mind that we're talking about this in terms of like there's a difference between like discussion and dialogue and platforming Mm -hmm. and just because we're willing to have a discussion with someone doesn't mean we're willing to platform them like Mm -hmm. you know i think that those are two very different things and by not platforming someone doesn't mean we're not open to a discussion um, but I, and, same, I, and the same thing goes for for any kind of for any kind of or go, kind of going back to the original uh, point. Same thing goes for an institution or a church. Just because you are discussing, encouraging employees to discuss, or encouraging members or whatever to have those discussions among themselves, doesn't mean you have to, as an organisation or as an institution, platform that discussion or platform that person or you know say that or back them as an organization or institution like those are two very different things and it's you know it's one thing to to say um you know we're not going to platform that it's a very different thing to say you can't talk about that because we think that's wrong Mm, you can't even bring it up or whatever i also find that the platforming thing really interesting because johan who you heard in episode one has had me on more than one occasion talk to his church who are by by my definition, maybe not by the definitions of their own context, but by mine, quite conservative um, on a lot of issues and definitely more conservative than I am. And they have platformed me as literally the guest communist, <laughs> you know, which is which is a big deal for, you know, a white evangelical church in in middle class South Africa. Like that's a that's a and the the confidence that that demonstrates, and it wasn't a hit job. It was genuinely like, well, let's give this person a chance, try and convince us kind of thing, which I thought was was amazing. But I also think what you were saying, Laura, about the, um, you know, the, 
you don't have to platform that church. Um, I've heard criticisms of, well, that church had a scandal. So, and, and a, a friend of mine from back in the day, somebody who was instrumental in me becoming a Christian um, and removing a bunch of obstacles from me becoming a Christian, uh, he posted a thing recently saying, you know, like, how can anybody be part of X church now that you've seen these um, X as the letter, not X church, um, uh, now that you've seen the revelations of whatever the latest scandal was. I was just like, but but what what church doesn't, where does this not happen? Like. You know, it happens in the Anglicans, it happens in the Catholics, it it, it will have happened in the Baptist, it'll happen everywhere. So so how can we how can we get, you know, to upper tea about um I don't know. I, I it, to me it, that that doesn't make sense. It's a if the church is refusing, if it is saying absolutely we are not going to address this, we are, you know, and this becomes a core part of their beliefs, or whatever, then you know, I would advise you to leave. But um also, I'm not going to judge you if you're still meeting God there. If you're participating in that kind of stuff, I'm going to say you're wrong. Mm. But, you know, it, again, it's so easy for us to exchange one set of toxic reasons to judge people for another righteous looking set of reasons to judge people. And there's that famous quote that I, I can't quote well, but all the Christians burning each other, each one convinced that the apostles would have done the same. You know, um, it, it's 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 an unhealthy place to get to, I think. Do you guys want to hear a fun thing, a cool thing, a bit of um, scientific study? Mm. No. <laughs> it's like, oh, Laura Not says the me. quietest hmm in the world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and Malky's, mm. Malky's, Malky's honest, which is good. I like that. Um, so we trailed this a little bit in the uh, first episode, and it's something called the NGO halo effect. And uh, guys, do you remember anything about this um, and about what you've read about it that you can give a kind of um, uh, a quick description of, and then I'll fill it out with some stuff that I've got here? I read it the makes... abstract oh, no, about that was a two hours ago. Okay. So let's pass to Malky. <laughs> There's you know, good reasons for doing bad things. Good people can have good reasons for doing good things that makes them do bad things, right? Is that what it is, John? It's actually surprisingly accurate, yeah. Um, uh, so the NGO halo effect, uh, there's a, a new study that has been released fairly recently. And I just realized that I have lost uh, the title of that. So if one of you wanted to find it while I am explaining it to you, it's the about... The title is How Moral Goodness Drives Unethical Behavior, Empirical Evidence for the NGO Halo Effect. Written by? Isabel de Bruin Cardoso, Alison R. Russell, and Lucas Magis. Magis. Those people. Um, Sorry, and, basically, <laughs> and basically what it says is that there's a few factors that make you um, that are common to NGOs that can make the NGO feel that it is moral and therefore make it behave in an unethical way because it thinks that it's moral. Um, and I think this is so true of churches and parachurch organizations. Um, uh, and it's called the NGO halo effect, where your NGO gets a halo for you and feels like an angel because it's uh, and not a biblical angel with lots of eyes and made of wheels. And that terrifies you so much. It, it tells you not to be afraid. It's the first thing it says, but like, like a sweet angel. Yeah, the NGO halo effect explains that three characteristics inherent to NGOs can lead to the perception of NGOs as morally good organizations. And that when this perception is glorified, it can lead to unethical behavior. Um, so for NGOs here, I want us to read churches. I want us to read, um, you know, cults of personality. I want us to read the parachurch, all of that sort of stuff. So this, the study said this. It said um, uh, the conceptual model on the NGO halo effect explains how the same inherent characteristics that explain NGOs perceived moral goodness can also explain NGO unethical behavior. So the things that actually make us feel moral about, about our organizations, say Soul Survivor, could make us just completely unable to believe that anything bad is happening there. Um, 
the, the model proposes that the perceived sense of moral goodness within NGOs can lead to the NGO being glorified by its staff and volunteers, creating the belief within the NGO that it is morally better than it actually is. The glorification of moral goodness is termed the NGO halo effect, and the model conceptualizes organizational level factors for how the NGO halo effect can explain NGO unethical behavior. It's a fascinating study. You should definitely go and read it. Um, the origin of the, the halo effect is from cognitive dissonance theory, you know, where you're like, if something conflicts with my core beliefs, I'm just going to become kind of unhinged about it. And I'm going to rather believe my general kind of perceptions of things uh, within this ideological framework than listen to any of the evidence. Um, and in the paper, it says people can create delusions about how they appraise something or someone, including themselves, which I think is true of the leaders who end up committing these terrible crimes, at least some of them who genuinely seem to think they've done nothing wrong, and then some of them who are clearly just predators who have joined these organizations specifically to be predators. Um, but there are three factors that can lead to three, lead to three uh, things happening within an organization. So there are three things about NGOs that make them uh, vulnerable to this. Uh, the first is called the non-distribution constraint. Are you guys still with me? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay, stay with me because if you're not with me, then the audience is not with me. Um, I'm with you. Ask me what the non-distribution constraint is. What's the non-distribution constraint effect? <laughs> no, just constraint. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what that is is people who are working at this place are doing for doing it for something other than their own benefit, right? Um, they're doing it for the mission, maybe. Um, so the purpose of this organization is to serve the public good and not create something of value primarily for me, okay? Or for the people who are doing this stuff. It's for somebody else. It's for the good of the world, right? So you can genuinely, I think, say, generally speaking, it's a good thing to work at a charity because you're doing something slightly less selfish than you would be if you're working in the private sector because you're getting paid less and you're doing it for this other thing, right? But what this can lead to is a perception that your organization's, um, uh, your, your mission is morally good. That's fine, right? I think it's fine. But then if you elevate the importance enough of your mission and you prioritize the mission too much, that can lead, as this says, to an ends justifies the means mentality, whereby any means, ethical or not, can be justified by the organization for the sake of achieving the mission. That is moral justification. Okay. And we've got moral justification, moral superiority, and moral naivety. Moral superiority is when you have, um, uh, it's based on the idea of privacy. So this is just this organization. It's not open to the whole world. It's just us doing it. Um, it can lead to the belief that uh, within the NGO that we know better, okay? Um, that actually the law or other people's concepts of what is moral or ethical aren't that important. and uh, what that is called is moral superiority. We decide what's good or bad. You don't decide what's good or bad. Imagine how that looks within an organization that is trying to hide the abuse that's happening. If you're morally superior, well, we decide what's good and bad. You can't listen to the newspapers. You can't listen to the safeguarding experts. Um, and if you've got moral justification going on, um, you're like, but we're leading people to Christ. How can, how can, how can you not make that your central priority? It's a powerful argument, but it does make you behave unethically. The third is the the voluntary characteristic. This means that people go to this and they they volunteer. They do this stuff for free. There are a lot of volunteers involved in it. That means again that you start thinking, well, this is a, people who do this. People who are part of this are good people. Uh, we are morally good people by virtue of being in this morally good organization. When that's glorified, ethics is not necessarily seen as necessary. You, you believe that the people here are too good. Nobody would do that. Nobody would cover this up. Nobody would allow that. They're good people who work here, and that's called moral naivety. So those are the three principles. And what's really interesting is in this study, they found that unethical behavior that they mapped in their study, 92% of it can be tracked, tracked back to the NGO halo effect or you could think of it as the church halo effect or the God's mission halo effect. And glorification of people was found in 85% of unethical behaviors that they tracked. 85% down to glorifying people, which I think sits very well with the kind of general narrative you're going to hear around this of like, well, these guys are superstars. If you put anybody on a pedestal, they're obviously going to become a 
fucking something that sounds like a pedestal. And then the next one was glorifying of knowing what is morally right, which was found in 74%. So we know what's right. Do you know how vulnerable we are as the church to these blind spots? We know what's morally right. We glorify people. Because the thing is, the churches who don't glorify people certainly think they know what's fucking morally right. And that is going to be just as difficult to escape in terms of the um, the negative consequences. So the moral uh, superiority explains unethical behavior in the name of meeting the mission. There's some examples here you read. Moral superiority explains why NGOs read churches feel motivated to break the law or fight against value-based systems they believe to be wrong and immoral. We further find that moral superiority can take place in organizations where, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, where certain people within the NGO believe that they know what's best and justify making decisions in the name of the organization while contradicting organizational policies. So having the policies isn't enough. Um, moral naivety explains when respondents did not see the need for internal ethics because, hey, we're all good people. And we just believe that everyone's, you know, you should you should just believe that everything's okay. Everyone's okay in this because we're all good people. And moral justification, uh, which is the first one, the moral justification explains the occurrence of continue or continuation of certain types of unethical behaviors in and by NGOs. So that's the NGO halo effect. And yeah, I just think it's really interesting. And I think you should read the 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 paper. Um, I've not done an excellent job of explaining it, but I I realise we have very limited time. You've done a decent one, to be yeah, fair. Job, yeah. um, but I think I think churches are massively <laughs> vulnerable to it because immediately as you go through, I think of certainly um, uh, Ravi Zacharias and uh, Mike Pavlacci and Mark Driscoll and. Tony Anthony and other like evangelists like got results, you know. So you can't you can't argue um with the results apparently. And especially if it's eternal, it's not just like, oh, we're saving people's lives, we're saving souls. So like whatever you need to do to get bums on seat is to get hands in the air, um, to get these young people saved. Um, and especially, yeah, the soul survivor thing of producing young leaders mm. having that kind of uh, incubator there um but also the, very uh, young ladies <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a dumb joke <laughs> nice <laughs> um but the uh the kind of uh, moral superiority thing is not just a secular moral superiority it's we actually have the blessing of god it's not just like oh, we're on a more noble quest we're on the noble quest like and from the it- lord and depending on your theology, the only noble quest. Yeah, but in which and case, other people's sorry, and other people are are not just don't share that. But if they're not in Christ, i.e., in my little niche of Christianity, then they're of the world and they're actively working against you. Yeah. So if your theology says people who are not in Christ are incapable of the levels of goodness that Christians are that's going to put you in a really dangerous position in terms of moral superiority. And maybe then Matty's thing of like, you know, burn it all to the ground. He didn't say that. And um, and start again with safeguarding as your foundation. I, I agree with Laura. I'm not sure that that is practical. I also think that safeguarding is already so present in so many churches, like it's on every wall. It is every HR department, every, I'm talking about big churches that have space for this kind of stuff, but even the small churches have, you know, safeguarding offices and stuff like that. It's it's the law, you, you have to. But if you have these moral superiority, if you have moral justification, if you have moral naivety, it's not going to mean anything. And a lot of what the the report said is that what needs to be done is very regular updates and engagement with this. I'm not sure that'll even do it because because those three moral kind of fallacies inoculate you against Mm -hmm. that. But what you could do is elevate the safeguarding of human beings and their non-abuse, their protection from abuse to something much higher it's not, you know, and again, as Matty said, it's not an add-on. If it is core to our mission, if we see our mission, yes, save souls. But if you want to save souls, you realize this stuff will come out and it will fuck up your witness and you will save no more souls. Then that's a reason enough if people are like ghoulishly pragmatic about it. But if you can elevate in them a sense of every human being is made in the image of God and everything that is done unto them is done unto Christ, 
you know, all abuse, then you can take it a lot more seriously. You can, you, if, if your church is valuing every person at that level, then it becomes part of the mission. Then, then you can, but it has to be integrated in that way. It has to be a sense and not safeguarding and not this is the most important thing, but these are human beings. It has to be done in our, in our, in our language and our, uh, our actual values, you know? Mm. Yeah, Sorry, I think I had no, absolutely. I think you're right, and I, I, I'm aware of the time, but I just have one, one more um, point from that. I find it very interesting that the top kind of case they found was a kind of what well, the top kind of reason for ethical behaviour was the glorification of people. I think that is really important to note, given the kind of what we have been talking about as well, and. I guess, I don't know, maybe this is just kind of a question for, for the group, but is using a person as brand even worth doing anymore in terms of that kind of, you know, is it always going to lead to some kind of immorality in that sense? And kind of follow up of that of, you know, is it kind of going down too much of the root of the model of the world at the moment in terms of, you know, what is the, what does every kid want to be when they grow up nowadays every if you ask any most children nowadays what they want to be when they grow up they want to be an influencer Podcast, uh. <laughs> well yeah they want to be a youtuber they want to be an influencer making a brand of yourself is a massive thing yeah in the world at the moment is They're it blaming... going to, Sorry. Is, it, is that going to lead to i don't know is that but I'm not sure that it always leads to that I also think blaming people for the effects of a system is yeah. always bad. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, you can do bad things within a system that pushes you in that direction, but in a, a world where data is sold and we are the product, where our attention is sold and our attention is the product, then then there is nothing wrong with people trying to flex that in order to have a better life. Y- you know, that's and that is the way the world works. It's it's. Uh, I think it's very easy to be kind of. Um, slightly moral moral superiority about it and go yes there should be no celebrities you know oh where did you get that oh well john mark Homer told me that do you know what i mean like the author's names are going to be on the books the- I think it's more i think it's more a question of do we it's not whether we should have like well i don't know maybe it is i don't know but the, the kind of like, i'm thinking about how soul survivor and mike pilavachi were one mm. brand and the same and you kind of get the same with, you know, with other, you know, Ravi Zacharias, yeah. it's the exact same. Like he was, he was the brand. Yeah. And it's it's different, I think, to having kind of people who have kind of maybe yeah, maybe maybe my point is different. You know, maybe it's you know, it's not the kind of decrying of celebrity in it. General people like John Mark Homer have you know within their own rights published books and built a name for themselves and things like that. I think it's more the kind of yeah, I don't know, creating a brand and an institution behind one person. That seems like a a poor decision if it's a church. Mm. I don't know how you avoid in a world where, in a world where you have singers. We live in a society. We live in a society or, um, or writers or whatever. They're, they're always going to be individuals who, if people like it, if it's good, it might get popular. And that I don't think is inherently a bad thing, you know, any more than, you know, the Wesleys getting famous was a bad thing, uh, you know, but that doesn't mean the Wesleys aren't assholes. <laughs> and you'll notice they're not around in the Methodist church hardly is either. So it's not true. Please don't get angry and at me, <laughs> Methodists. But I think we're coming to, to the end and we still have one guest um, who we asked the question of, as we've asked um, uh, a lot of people involved in this, what can we learn from situations like that? That's what these two episodes have been about, right? It's like, what can we learn from uh, the 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 fall of of you know high and mighty Christian leaders or celebrities, or whatever we want to call them? Uh, and Mark Woods has a very interesting thought on that. So there's another church scandal, and everybody starts talking about what we can learn from the sad story of Mike Pellavacci. And I'm just going to cut to the chase here and say nothing at all, because it's happened before so many times and in so many places, and we already know everything that we need to know. We know that charismatic leaders need to be watched like hawks to make sure that they don't go astray. 
We know that leaders are fallible and need support to do the right thing, or at least not to do the wrong thing. We know that there need to be strict systems of accountability. We know that people need to speak up and take responsibility if they see things going wrong. We know that organizations close ranks for a quiet life and that some brands become too big to fail. Everyone at Soul Survivor could have preached sermons and led seminars on this, and there is literally nothing that anyone needs to learn. There's a Bible passage that speaks straight into this. Uh, it's when the Israelites were given the choice of having a monarchy or a sort of semi-democratic theocracy. Uh, it's 1 Samuel chapter 8, and Samuel warns them, well, uh, if you have a king, he'll take your sons for his army and to till his fields. He'll take your daughters to be his servants. He'll take your lands, your produce, your livestock. And he says, in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Or if you prefer Terry Pratchett to the Bible, um, how about this? It was as if even the most intelligent person had this little blank spot in their heads where someone had written, kings, what a good idea. Whoever had created humanity had left in a major design flaw. It was its tendency to bend at the knees. And I think the Pilavachi affair, like so many others, just illustrates the idea of kingship, that some human being can think for you and decide for you and basically own you because of the position that they occupy and the reputation they have and the glamour that they cast. And we all know that that's not true. And there is literally nothing to learn. The trouble is that there is a disjunction between what we know in our heads and what we do. And what happens is that we resign our judgment in favor of someone else's. It might be because of vulnerability. It might be because of wickedness. Often it's the result of cowardice. It doesn't surprise me, to be perfectly honest, because I am, uh, as any Orthodox Christian ought to be, fundamentally pessimistic about human nature. And I don't think we'll actually stop it because of, you know, sin and stuff. But there are two things that might just help. The first thing is, well, think about those Roman triumphs when the general or the Caesar of the day would ride through the cheering crowds with the spoils of victory and a slave in the carriage with them would lean over and whisper in their ear, remember thou art mortal. And these people need that kind of slave in their lives possibly we all do, to tell them they are not entitled, no matter how they might think. The second thing is that these people are often very good at theology, but absolutely terrible at ethics, teaching ethics, the difference between right and wrong. And if somebody isn't teaching about how you treat people ethically, that's probably a red flag, because it means it's probably not high on their agenda. So neither of these things is going to stop bad behavior, but they might perhaps just help a little bit. But basically, there's nothing that we don't know. There is literally nothing to learn. I, I freaking love Mark Woods so much. <laughs> There's Mark Woods, ex of the Baptist Times and Methodist Recorder and currently at the Bible Society. Uh, what do you guys think? I think he raises the good point and touches on something that, that that Massey mentioned as well, actually, in that abuse itself, we're not going to be able to protect against. Like there is there is always going to be abuse um in in our world. We are humans that are slaves to sin. Like we are going to sin. There is going to be abuse. What is important is catching it early and having the things and methods in place to catch it early, having the, the slave whispering into the ear that thou art mortal. And, you know, it's something that, um, yeah, like Matthew said as well, of being able to have, be able to speak up and say like, hey, like that's not okay. Like with the sole survivor situation, somebody, pro pro I mean, I, probably somebody did speak up early and was, was told that they they weren't able to, you know, was guess it or put away or whatever. But like the fact that they had non-official interns is a massive red flag. <laughs> and like things like that are quite easy, small things that should not be happening. 
that are pathways to being <laughs> being abused and being taken advantage of. I mean, official interns also, but you know, that's a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's being able to have the capacity to catch it early and the avenue to catch it early and, you know, the accountability and the and the methods and and in place to be able to to speak out and against it. Mm. I do think I'd be um wonder if you guys agree, like it's very, very slow, but it feels like now there's much more of a discourse and we have the language like gaslighting and things like that to mm. know either as a victim what's going on certainly like young people you know when you get to a certain age you know i think kids are, are, are massively vulnerable but certainly you know when you get to your teens and into 20s you can see actually you know something about power, power, power dynamics which i would just be unaware of at that mm. age um and you can either spot that or like peers can spot that like you're coming home telling these stories and be like I think that's a bit fucked up man <laughs> like yeah. you know whereas like you know they took to talk about a specific example of the the alleged wrestling that would happen one-to-one with mike Pil- pilavachi and his interns that like it was accepted rather than people going like um wait a minute you know because i think the the like uh matty's kind of um picking over the bones of a um flight crash seems to ring a similar tone to me of Mark Woods of being like, we fucking know this. Like, I don't know if I'm misreading this tone of like, we've been through this. We've had enough scandals. Like, we know this stuff and yeah. uh, do feel a wee bit attacked when it's like, because that's kind of speaking to podcasts and articles and uh, the hot take industrial complex. It's like, what can we learn from? It's like, yeah, well, yeah, we know this stuff, man. Yeah. Like, the question is not, it. yeah, the question is not learning. It's not a new hot take. It's actually putting in place different focuses for culture, different structures and different accountability. It's The question isn't about how do we learn from this, it's why are we still letting this happen? I think some of that is in those, yeah. those um, halo effects, right? Mm. The reason yeah. is because we don't believe that bad people exist in these organizations. We think that a lot of the ends justify the means. We fundamentally think, well, we know best, which is hard to avoid in religious situations, but I don't think impossible, not once we're aware of it. Anyway, bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been Beer Christianity. If it's the first time you're listening, we do this kind of stuff and other kinds of things. We usually talk about the beers we've been drinking, but we recorded this all on one night. So we finished our beers. Or in my case, the one, Roger, that you gave me is absolutely terrible. I'm so sorry. I, I cannot <laughs> drink it. It's appalling. Uh, but thank you. The gift, the thought, you know, very, very appreciated. The beer itself, not not nearly as much. Um, I actually moved on to port. Oh, very classy. That's why you got so classy. Um, and if my mum and dad are listening to this on their way back from France, thank you for the port, Graham. Uh, thank you for listening to us. We're going to be at Greenbelt. Um, uh, almost certainly all three of us, though uh, we're not entirely sure, but definitely uh, two of us will be there. And we would really like to hang out with you and Let have you a beer. You guess too. <laughs> the Jesus arms and um, yeah well uh, when the we were talking about should we just tell you on this day at this time at this place we're going to let you know that we're going to be there but actually that's a terrible idea because what if we end up missing or you end up having to miss a band or a speaker or someone who you want to hear uh, so we're first going to see what our interview schedule is for the event and then we're going to see what the um, performance schedule is but we would really like to have a kind of beer Christianity hangout meetup type thing we're potentially going to uh, get a discount on our shirts. So if you want to buy a shirt and wear it to the thing and look like an absolute nerd for Beer Christianity. <laughs> no, um, look like an absolute, absolute like, rock star. Rock the kind star. of person who can never be yeah. questioned. <laughs> People of your preferred gender will be throwing themselves at you they in your be... hot ass t shirt. Uh, yes. We're going to be interviewing <gasps> Paul yes. very um, soon. Very, very soon. In fact, on Tuesday, the 18th of July, which is in five days' time, if my calculations are correct. And I'm quite bad at maths, so they might not be. Um, but if you have questions for Paul, if you have thoughts about Greenbelt that you want to share, um, if you want to try, if you want us to try and see if there are any secret guests um, lined up that haven't been announced yet, um, let us know. Get in touch on uh, beerchristianity at yahoo.com. 
Yay. Or, because most people get in touch with us via the Instagrams, uh, you can do it there as well. So, yeah, anyway, find us on all the places and, um, yeah, tell your friends about it. Um, thanks for listening and goodbye. Bye. See ya. Changing it up. <laughs>